to zoom out. Go to my brush. From my brush menu, I'm just going to select a nice rough brush here. Above the color menu, or color layer, I'm going to create a new layer. That's Control shift n From my swatches, I'll select a dark brown. And I'm just going to suggest a kind of gown down here. I'm going to bring this up above the specular. And the OCC passes. Harden the edge of that eraser. And here you can see this is where I can actually use my mat pass. If I use the wand tool to select the green here. There we go. Now I can come in with my eraser, and I can just erase out the thumb, so my thumb can overlap that block in that I've got for the um, the skirt. I'll go ahead and lock transparency on the pixels on that skirt, go back into the brush, and let's grab something that's just a little bit lighter. Set my brush opacity a little bit lower, and I'll just start dying this out. lock the transparency again. Go back to my brush menu and I'm going to select one of these brushes down here. Select the 170. I'm going to dial up that hue. Turn up the strength on my blur brush here. Not that strong. I'm going to undo those three strokes. And we'll set it to about 60. I don't want to get too caught up in this. I just want to start suggesting something there. Go into the levels control. And we'll darken this a bit. Okay, 
I'm going to go ahead and start laying some texture on top of this before we go on, just to get some noise into the image. And to do that, I'm just going to open up one of my kind of go-to texture images. There we go. We've got a nice picture of a dirty wall. And you can use any kind of noisy image here. I'm just going to select all of it, copy it, close the image, and then I'm going to paste it back down. I'm going to do it from the top level here. Go into transform mode and I'll just scale this. Rotate it. There we go. And then I'll go into overlay blending mode. You see that gives me this nice texture, this next nice uh, feel to the skin here. And I can actually desaturate this a bit, control U to bring up my hue saturation control. And I'll dial back that saturation. And I can dial back the opacity. So you can see the effect that that has. It really adds a nice you know, extra level of, of noisy, dirty, filthy skin to it. And it has a nice effect on the centipede as well. It just helps break up that color. I'm going to lay a background in now. I have this nice sort of sandstone image. Load that in. It takes Zebra or take Photoshop a minute to load that up. There we go. Select all of that, copy, and then I'm going to paste this in. But we can't see it yet, so what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to use my mats here. If I go to my magic wand. And I'll just select the black areas here. Make sure that we get any of these contained areas in between the legs of the bug. turn off that utility layer. Then I'll come down through here and I'll start deleting everything that's outside of that mat. That's just going to delete the background and now you can see that brings that background image up and, and visible for me now. I need to scale it down though. It's pretty high res. Scale this down. There we go. Now I don't want it to be that yellow, so I can go to Control B, and Control B is going to bring up the color balance sliders here, so I can actually back off the yellow with it like that. Uh, maybe add green, or I could take out the saturation by going to Control U for hue saturation, and then backing off the saturation on it. And 
I might actually scale this up a bit. And I'll bring up the levels menu here with control L and then I'll try and back off on that backdrop a bit. I'm going to try and keep the background a different value than the skin. He's getting a bit lost in that backdrop right now. Actually, I'm going to delete that for right now. And for the time being, I'm going to make the background about a 50% gray. Cre create a new layer here. And then select all and then alt delete. Now if I control click on one of these layers with the body in there, it'll select the outline of the body. I can come up here to the top layer where I've got my noise. I can control I to invert that and then control Alt Shift J and it'll cut out the outline, the outer portion. So I can turn off or turn off the, the, the noise layer that's going on the outside of the body. I can also dial back this opacity even more than what I've got that's sitting on top of the body itself. So at this stage we've got the noise layer, that sort of dirty image, it's matted out, it's chopped out on top of the body, and we've cut out the exterior which is out on the background and we've dialed back the opacity on that. So I'm just going to go ahead and name these uh, descriptively. I'm just selecting the eraser and just going to grab a uh, bit of a textured brush and go in and just kind of randomly knock back some of the uh, the noise that's on top of the body. And I'm going to the color balance or the uh, down here at the bottom of the uh, the layers menu, I'm selecting the levels adjustment layer, and this allows me to make an adjustment to just you know a section of an image and all the layers below it, or the entire image and all the layers below it. So I've done a, a levels control here at top, and now I'm selecting the mask that comes with it and putting a gradient in there. So I've selected the gradient tool, and I'm by applying a gradient into that mask layer. What it's going to do is going to allow me to knock the levels down as it gets further down the image. So it gives it the impression of being lit from above. It gives you this nice fall off going from the regular levels down to a darker image. All you need to do is just click on the layer mask to be able to paint into that or apply a gradient to it. And coming back in here with the eraser brush, just kind of just randomly erasing out bits from that um, from that noise layer. You know, I've accidentally moved the layer, so undo that, and then I lock it. And I'll temporarily lock layers so I don't run into an issue where you know I'm accidentally selecting them when I want to select a layer that's on top or nearby. I'm just going in now and just do, doing really rough brush strokes just to kind of suggest some sort of drapery down here. I'm not too concerned about anything that's happening below the waist on this figure. I'm just going to let this sort of fall off into, you know, uh, ultimately at the end it's going to be blurred out by depth of field. So I just want to make some bold suggestions of shapes down there so once it's blurred you'll be able to see something. But I don't want your eye to get caught up in it. I want you to be much more concerned with his his centipede, his hands, and his face. You know, that right along that diagonal that's going across the picture plane right now from the upper left hand corner and down to the lower right. So at this stage, I'm going to think about hair. 
and I actually rethink this several times over the course of it. The problem, well, the first thing that I do here, and I do this a lot, is I do the most obvious thing first. Even if I'm aware it's the most obvious thing, I'll do it just so I can say, okay, I've done that, now let's backtrack and do something else. So I'm doing this sort of Crypt Keeper hair. And it's it's pretty cool, but it, it kind of reminds me of Riff Raff from Rocky Horror Picture Show, which is why I don't end up going with it. But I do think it looks cool. I like the way it looks, and it's got a bit of a Bernie Reichston zombie feel to it. And on another day, I might stay with it. But what I'm doing is I'm just using uh, a custom brush here. It's just a series of dots, and I'll make that available to you so you can recreate this, this hair stroke. And I'm just making these squiggly lines. You know, just trying to break up the silhouette of the top of the head. I've gone in and selected a lighter gray. I'm just dragging these strokes along too. Hair, I think, is a lot of fun to sculpt, or a lot of fun to paint. You know, just pull your strokes in and then you know, go in with a lighter color and try and catch some highlights along them. I, uh, I really enjoy doing hair. I'm going to pull some strands across his uh, bald plate at the top of his head. So yeah, I mean, I think this hair looks really cool, but you will notice that I don't end up going with it. I go with something that's more like a shock wig, two tufts sticking up from the top of his head. Because it kind of, well, we'll talk about it when we get to it, but I think it just works a little bit better. It's, it's unique. So I'm going to move into time lapse here. And then I'll come back and we'll talk more after we've done a little bit more painting. So now we're speeding through the rest of this thought process on the hair. And you'll see me go ahead here and try a few different things, pull the hair out and make it a little bit more wild. Uh, what I'd like you to take away from this, though, is while I think this is cool and this the hair works in a lot of ways, it's just not right for this character, so I'm not afraid just to, to stop and move on to something else. So I would kind of encourage you to... to don't be married to anything. Don't be afraid to just stop and move to another part of the image and, and reevaluate something later. Or just take it out completely. Because a big fear, you know, something that, that I'll often do, is I'll just feel married to part of an image and I won't change it because I feel like I've already put so much time into it. Uh, which is another benefit of, you know, like I was saying in the sculpting section, where if you, you work quickly and gesturally around something, if you work it all at the same time to the same level then it's kinda easy to to to, to backtrack and and change something big uh, if you haven't invested you know just an enormous amount of time pouring over one particular area so this is really cool I do like this limp zombie hair that's happening here who knows maybe I will uh, do another version of this guy with uh, this stringy zombie locks Since you've seen the final image, you'll know that what I've done is I've actually brought these two tufts of hair up from the top of his head, which sort of echo those two antennae on the centipede. That's why I made that choice. It was different. It was unique. Uh, it was an unexpected way of dealing with his hair, and it also had a nice echo with another part of the image. So you see that you get a really nice lighting effect just with that that layers uh, adjustment layer up there by putting that, or excuse me, that levels adjustment layer up at the top of all the layers it really is a nice way to just dial in a lighting effect across the whole figure and it's something that I use on everything that I do I always try and drop one part of it into shadow and part of that is if you drop you know the bottom quarter of the figure into shadow and you have to finish something in a day which is often the case you need to get an image out in a day if you can drop portions of it into shadow you don't have to draw that part uh, if the you know the legs, if the hips and the legs aren't important in this case for anything other than the composition, just to to raise him up in this portrait uh, oriented figure frame, then you know I can I can drop those off, and it's nice and dramatic. It gives you this nice dramatic lighting where he's being hit with a strong key light from the upper left. So it's a uh, it's a cool technique, and it's something that I, I actually I make I make use of a lot. All right, so now I'm using my my matte layer that I made so I can just select the centipede. You can see here that we've gone in and we've grabbed just the centipede. And I've duplicated him and I've scaled him down. 
So you see what I'm doing here is I've duplicated that centipede by making that selection. I've moved him down to an angle. Make sure that it's behind the other centipede. You don't want that uh, that duplicate centipede on top. You want it to be sitting behind the other one. And the reason for this is we're going to make a shadow because the centipede isn't quite sitting in his hand because it's not really casting a nice shadow. ZBrush didn't quite pull off the shadow that I had hoped for there. I need to, to anchor him and, and give him a sense of weight like he's sitting there and in the palm of his hand and wrapped around his arm. And the best way to anchor one thing to another is to cast a shadow from one object onto the other object that will then connect them. So I've duplicated now and I've shifted or I'm shifting over this duplicate of the uh, of the centipede. Go to the layers menu, levels menu, dial that all the way down to black, click OK, and then I'll go to the filter menu and I'll just add a Gaussian blur. So the Gaussian blur that fuzzes that shadow out. There you can see there's my menu. Click OK. So now I've got a nice shadow cast from the centipede onto the arm. I'll need to dial back the opacity of that shadow layer a bit. But first I'm going to warp the shadow here where he's sitting closer to the palm of the hand. Notice that I, I warped that shadow just so it's not cast quite so far away because I want it to feel like he's really sitting down close to the palm. So now I select the shadow, inver or select the centipede, invert the selection. Or excuse me, I select his body and invert the selection. So I'm deleting the shadow which is outside of his body. Anything, any bit of that shadow that's not overlapping with his body, I've just deleted. And that's accomplished just by control clicking on the layer with the body on it and then inverting the selection. So this stage, I'm going to go ahead and revisit that hair and then try a few more options. We'll switch into a time lapse here and you can see the thought process as I'm just sketching things in. And I just select a rough brush and just sketch in shapes. It's nothing it's nothing too involved. It's really just exploring different shape options now. So at this stage is really just about making big pliable shapes. I've selected the smear brush and I'm smearing these strokes around trying to create a big you know, pliable mass of hair coming off the top of his head. And I was thinking about a big, you know, shock wig, you know, big frightening hair, but the problem with this one that I start to, to see is it just reminds me a bit of Dragon Ball Z. So I I backtrack from this as well. This is really how the process goes, at least for me, is I experiment with things, put them down on, on paper, as it were and then see what they make me think of or how they make me feel and if it doesn't feel right I'll just backtrack and go to something else. I mean that's if you don't already have a plan in place ahead of time and oftentimes I'm really just exploring something as it goes. So I just named my layer there and I've selected a new brush now and the idea here I'm thinking is I'm just gonna make a big two big tufts of hair and this is the one that I like this is the one that works because I feel like this makes a big triangle out of his head and it's different it's unique and still has a bit of a crazed, maniacal feel to it. But it turns his head into a big triangle. It echoes that angle in his jaw, the angle in his teeth and his mouth, and the angle in his nose. So it has a very acute sensibility, or acute feeling, an acute angle. Even though this is actually a right triangle, if you look at it. It's, um, that one is my favorite, though, so that's why we do stick with hairstyle that's close to this. Now at this stage I need to organize my layers, so I select the hair, and group them into a, a, a group called hair, and I'll do the same for these two overlay layers. I'll select both of those and I'll put them into a group. Group that together and name that overlays. And in that layer I'll pull that uh, lighting effect as well as the two dirt layers. And I just find it helpful to have all of these things where I've got multiple layers doing a certain thing. I like having them grouped together in folders like this. It just makes it so much easier, especially if you have to revisit your document. And there's times that I've had to revisit a character from months and months ago, 
and if I don't have my layers named and grouped, it's a real pain. Now, at this stage, I want to go in and start to suggest some drapery back here in the skirt area. So I'm just very loosely, very quickly sketching in some shapes down there, just so it's not a big black dead spot. And that's all that I'm really doing right now at this point. So again, this area will be kind of fuzzed out. I don't want to draw your eye to it. So at this point, I'm going to use the Smart Sharpen filter. The Smart Sharpen filter allows me to pull out just a little bit of detail in an area where I've made some very loose strokes. It's a little bit blurry. I do this a lot when I'm trying to create a sense of like rough fabric or leather, things like that, because it just goes in and makes all these little, little bits that can read as detail, and then you can selectively smooth areas back. It works really nicely. I like it quite a lot. And that's just the Smart Sharpen filter. So now we want to create a sense of rim light on this guy. And we do have our, our spec layer here. And that spec layer, I can adjust the levels on that. You can see this in just a moment here. If I come down here and select the spec layer, and right now that layer is what's giving me that nice sort of rim light that's happening there. And if I were to crunch the levels on it, I can increase the brightness of that rim light. And I can take it up to you know way too high. Or I can just push it up a little bit so it can accentuate that light coming along the rim there. And you can colorize that too. And if I drag that specular layer up above the color, you can see that it, it actually accentuates the effect quite a bit, a little too much. So I need to dial back from them. Probably erase out some of that, uh, that specular, especially where it's overlapping the, uh, the skirt down there. So now I'm going in with, uh, with a brush and painting black into the layer mask. And the reason I'm using a layer mask for this is because I don't necessarily want to erase, I don't want to destroy that specular layer. Maybe I want to keep some of the, uh, the data in case I want to paint back into it and, and return some of the shininess. And this is really just all about painting grays and blacks into that layer mask to, to mute the effect, because anything black in a layer mask hides anything white shows. So shades of gray will you know, adjust the opacity of something. So at this stage I'm painting further into the spec mask, just trying to knock out little streaks through those, those long specular highlights, just trying to break them up a bit so it feels a little bit less plastic. If I turn that on and off, you can see the vast difference you get. It really helps to pull the character forward out of the background by having that rim light there. Now I'm going to use the magic wand tool and my mask to select just the uh, centipede. And I want to adjust the specular here just on him. I want that to be much brighter. I definitely want him to seem shinier than the skin. And I did that just by, when I had it selected, I just control J to jump up, uh, copy that part of the specular map, or the specular pass, and just copy that up. And trying a few different uh, blending modes there, but coming back to screen. And now I'm selecting him and going to the color, and I'm going to jump Control J to duplicate the color up once, and then I'll go to my blending mode and set it to overlay. And you'll see what will happen here is I'm going to get a nice kind of a rich orangey hue. It really will seem very, very punched up color. And that's just by me taking the color pass, duplicating it, and putting it on top of itself as an overlay layer. So 
So I'll do a lot of that while I'm working and taking the color and putting it back on top of itself as either an overlay or a soft light. And it's hard to say what you're going to get every time because it's always a little bit different. It tends to punch the color up, make things a little bit richer and a little bit clamped, so to speak. Um, give it a try, though. It's something that I'll do often when I'm just looking for something cool. I'll experiment with blending modes, uh, usually overlay and soft light, just to see what I can make happen. And here I'm painting a bit of rim light in. I've created a new layer called rim light. And I have a selection right now for the body, but the selection is hidden. You can hide your selection by using Control H. And I'm just painting along the edge, trying to punch up that rim light a bit and really pull him out of the uh, out of the background. I'm going to my brush control and I'm turning on other dynamics so I can get a taper based on my brush pressure because I want it to to feather off as I lightly stroke along the surface. 